Welcome to AP Podcast 7.3. This is on the hydrogen spectrum, and we're also going to talk about the Bohr atom. If you remember what we did last time where we talked about uh, wavelength and frequency and the energy involved, uh, I want to talk about what happens with hydrogen. And in fact, it happens with all elements, but I believe they studied hydrogen first. So what happens is, let's say you take a hydrogen atom and you excite it. Now, you can excite it with some of those energy waves we looked at the last podcast, or maybe you pump it full of electricity or heated or something. But whenever you do, some lines are given off in the visible spectrum, and it's always the same lines. And in this case, it's a violet line... Uh, a blue line. This ends up being a, like a teal color and a red line. And it doesn't matter when you do it or how often you do it. In the visible spectrum, those four lines are always given off. In other words, it's like a fingerprint of the atom, which is unique, which is a very useful tool because if you look at the emission that's given off by each element, you can tell what element it is. So this was a very big deal because scientists were still trying to figure out this this atom model where the electrons were both waves and particles and things like that. But uh, what this led them to believe, anyways, is that there were only certain energies that were allowed for the hydrogen atom because they were always seeing those over and over and over. And so since they could only give off certain energies, Okay? It kind of supported that whole idea of packets of energy or energy being quantized in discrete, uh, what is now believed to be energy levels. And so where did it really start? Well, Niles Bohr uh, developed a model for the hydrogen atom. And what he thought is he thought that the atoms were like a solar system where the electrons were going around in orbits. And you've got positive and negative charges there and they attract each other but because the uh, electrons are traveling around the nucleus so fast they don't fall into the nucleus kind of like the idea on why the moon doesn't crash into the earth because it's going around so with his model and let me just give you a quick picture of it it looks something like this with his model um, he didn't really know why there were only certain energy uh, energies allowed he just knew that they were so what he did is he called these energy levels and those of you that have been in my class before know about energy levels so here's energy level one and two and three and you can see them labeled right there and um, so Bohr came, whoa what in the heck I don't know what that is sorry about that guys um, so what Bohr found is that no matter what happens when you put this energy in there you always get the same lines and so he postulated that this, now this is, pretend this is red, all right, I know it looks orange, but I couldn't make red for some reason over there, so pretend that red one is uh, going from energy level one to two, all right, or I should say going back down, all right, and when you get an electron going from energy level uh, three to one, it gives off the teal line, and four to one gives off the violet line, and so on and so on, so, um, those, this is the model, and it worked very, very well for the hydrogen atom. It worked perfectly, in fact. And so it was a, it was a very big deal. It gave scientists something to build on when they came up with the model that we have today. And with these energy levels and these wavelengths, remember, this is some kind of wavelength, whether this is, uh, I don't know, 700 nanometers or something, and pretend the red line is about 400 nanometers, Remember, with Planck's constant and this wavelength, we can find out what kind of what kind of energy we've got happening here, and we can use an equation called the Rydberg equation, where <clears throat> we simply just uh, take the energy level, which happens to be one, two, three, four, five. It's some kind of whole number, and uh, we just calculate it using this constant right here. And notice, notice this constant is in joules, right? And that's important because um, Whenever we have some kind of joules, we're dealing with energy. So the ground state, of course, is 1. And then anything going up above that is just some kind of uh, integer. So in order to figure out what kind of energy is involved when going from one energy level to another, we can, do, uh, we can use this equation to find it for one energy level, let's say the first one. And then we can use the same equation for maybe the third energy level. And by the way, this is with hydrogen. We kind of keep this with hydrogen because it gets a little messy after that. So let's try one. <clears throat> so I've got this, 
I've got this equation here. It says calculate the energy needed to move an electron from energy level 1 to, to level 2. And then further on, it says, what is the wavelength of light that must be absorbed by a hydrogen atom in its ground state to reach that excited state? So imagine this. We're, we're talking about if this is energy level 1 right here, and this is energy level 2, we're trying to find the energy from this energy level down to this energy level. And as it st says right here, uh, what wavelength of light must be absorbed in order to reach that excited state. So that's going up. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a try. Um, let me get my calculator out. We'll do. It. All right, so here we go. E equals a negative two point one seven eight times ten to the negative eighteenth joules. Right, and times z. Remember, we're talking about a hydrogen atom, so the the charge on the nucleus is one. So I'm just gonna, you know, I'm not gonna write a one there. You guys can handle that. And then we're talking about the first energy level, so one squared. And so hopefully you realize that the energy involved there would be a negative 200 or 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18th joules, right? So that's the energy at the first energy level. Well, let's do the same thing with the energy at the second energy level. And hopefully you realize that this is exactly going to be the same, okay, this, this uh, number at the top. But on the bottom of this number would be 2 squared, right? And hopefully I haven't lost you, but this number is going to go right there. I'm just trying to save a little time. Okay, and so when I work that out, I get a negative 5.445 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Okay, so now how do we figure out uh, what's the, the energy involved? Well, it's the energy final minus the energy initial. And remember, what is it doing right here? It's moving an electron from 1 to 2. So where's the final? The final is this number. And so this is the final number right here. And this is the initial. So when I subtract those two, uh, I get a value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Now, how can I use this to solve this problem? Well, let me get my eraser here and erase some of this stuff. I'll erase all that except for this, our final answer. All right. Well, remember this equation right here? E equals Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength, right? Well, let's just switch these two terms so that I get the wavelength equals Planck's constant speed of light over E. And when I put in my energy, which happens to be this number right there, I get a value for a wavelength to be 1.2 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Okay, So that's the wavelength of light that must be absorbed to get it to go from its ground state to energy level 2. Kind of neat. Doesn't happen very often in AP, but it's, it's a good practice to to be able to do this. So this is kind of what Bohr was doing. He had these ideas, everything was kind of fitting, and it was working really well, which is a great thing, right? Well, there's there's only one problem, okay? The Bohr model doesn't really work, um, you know, except for hydrogen, right? So anytime you add another uh, electron and a proton, it's an, another element, we have some problems. So uh, that that led some scientists to come to a new idea, and that's where uh, Schrodinger and de Broglie did some more work and came up with our modern quantum model. But the important thing is, is that Bohr's work kind of got them going. Um, you know, electron, like I said right here, electrons don't move in circles. We know that they're just, they're going around the atom in what's called orbits, and we'll talk, or orbitals, which we'll talk about uh, next time. So anyways, hopefully this makes a little bit of sense. We'll do a couple problems here. Again, if you have any questions, uh, we'll go over in class. See you next time.